I'm Steve Levitsky. I am David Rockefeller, Professor of Latin American Studies and Professor of Government at Harvard. We have in Venezuela the regime that in the last, um, really last 30 years, is the most authoritarian regime we've seen in all of Latin America outside of Cuba. It is um, pretty unambiguously the world's worst economic crisis uh, and has um, become something that's not terribly common in recent decades in South America, which is a full-scale humanitarian crisis. So Venezuela's economy has collapsed over the last six years or so, six or seven years, um, in, in a way that it now beyond the, be, uh, worse than the crisis of the U.S. Uh, Great Depression, worse than the crisis, the economic crisis in Weimar Germany prior to the rise of Hitler. It's one of the, uh, one of the all-time worst economic collapses with uh, negative growth as GDP contractions of more than 10% a year for three consecutive years. So this is uh, a, an economic collapse of historic proportions. Venezuela has been in, in a state of hyperinflation for more than a year. It may reach a million percent this year. Um, so this is a pretty clearly the worst economic crisis on earth today. Um, that is, uh, has contributed to a uh, massive humanitarian crisis. Three million Venezuelans have left the country it may be that another 2 million leave the country before the end of the year, maybe reach 5 million by the end of the year. So it's become a regional refugee crisis in, in Latin America. It's, it's, had, uh, it's created problems in, uh, in Colombia, in Peru, in Ecuador, Chile, and other countries. This is, the last 40 years has been the, the most democratic period in the history of Latin America. To the extent that democracies have broken down, they've slid like Peru in the 1990s or Ecuador in the early 2000s or early mid 2000s into sort of hybrid regimes, uh, what I would call competitive authoritarian regimes that are not fully democratic, but in which uh, electoral competition persists. There's a, a sort of skewing of the playing field. So it's not fair electoral competition, but uh, the it's, it's, a, it's pretty soft authoritarianism. And most of these regimes haven't lasted that long. So the Fukimori regime lasted for eight years in Peru. Uh, Korea was in power for about a decade in, in, uh, in Ecuador. The regime in Venezuela had been competitive authoritarian since about the mid-2000s, but in the last five years has descended into outright dictatorship. It's more, more of an outright dictatorship than anything we've seen outside of Cuba since the late 1980s. So we have an economic crisis, a social crisis, and a political crisis. There is some relationship between uh, the election of populists, the successful rise of populists to the presidency, and a descent into, again, what I would call competitive authoritarianism. When you're elected with a mandate to destroy the old political elite, and then you're surrounded by the old political elite in Congress or in the courts or in other constitutional checks and balances, very, very often these presidents get into conflicts with, um, with uh, other constitutional bodies, with other checks and balances. And... Um, when these guys are popular, and they very often are very popular in the initial years, they're often pretty successful in steamrolling, sometimes closing down or dissolving these rival powers. And so that's what we saw with Fukimori in the 1990s, we saw it with Correa, we saw it to some degree with Evo Morales, we saw it with Perón back in the 40s, and we saw it with Chavez in the early 2000s. But again, it, um, it was a soft authoritarian regime in that the, there was a, the opposition was allowed to, to organize, was in jail, was in, for the most part exiled, was able to compete in elections that were not entirely fair because the government abused resources and was, was increasingly stacking the playing field, but that were reasonably clean. And Chavez, through 2011-2012, was, was pretty popular. Between 2004 and about 2012, uh, he had majority support. Surveys showed over and over again that he had a lot of support. Chavez, for in, if you go back to 2005, 6, 7, 8, he got 60, 70 percent support. By the time of his death, his last re-election in 2012, it's more 50-50. So the regime wasn't that repressive, in part because um, Chavez didn't need to be that repressive. The, the problem comes when two things are happening. One, Maduro is, is um, a much, much less talented, less charismatic uh, figure than, than Hugo Chavez. Hugo Chavez was a, uh, like him or not, was a great political talent, and uh, Maduro's not. Um, and he, he lacked Chavez's legitimacy, he lacked Chavez's charisma, he lacked his political skill, 
and he eventually very quickly lacked his popularity. And secondly, Chavez had the um, essentially the luck of uh, dying before things got really bad in, in Venezuela. The economy really was already uh, slipping quite a bit, but really began to fall off a cliff um, under Maduro. And um, I mean, he was, he was probably headed for that cliff anyway, but Chavez leaves the scene, leaves it in, in Maduro's hands. So Maduro is a not very good politician, he's not very charismatic, and the economy is awful. And by the first year of the Maduro presidency, he's in the 30s and quickly into the 20s in public support. So it's harder, much harder, to maintain the fiction of democracy when you've got 23% approval rating as opposed to 50 or 60% approval rating. And it was mostly the fact, one, that, uh, that the government could no longer win clean elections, and two, that starting in 2013-14, there were massive... Uh, opposition protest, massive op opposition mobilization that that included not just the old political elite, not just the upper middle class, the middle class that backed members of the old elite, but rather a good chunk of the lower middle class, the popular sectors, uh, were were beginning to mobilize against the regime. So the the regime, the the government was in danger for the first time since two thousand two, two thousand three. For the first time in more than a decade, these guys were actually in danger of getting tossed out, and um, that made them much more repressive. And so it was slow. The 2015 legislative election was actually fairly clean. The opposition won overwhelmingly, won control of the Congress. So it can't be all that an autocratic regime if the opposition is allowed to overwhelmingly win legislative elections and take control of, of Congress. But in response to that, the Congress, or the, the government, excuse me, used its control over a packed Supreme Court to essentially emasculate the Congress. Everything Congress passed, the Supreme Court would rule it unconstitutional. And then finally, to uh, basically allow the Congress to be set aside and replaced by a pretty illegitimate, unconstitutional, uh, and not even really elected constituent assembly, which uh, enabled a completely unconstitutional and fraudulent 2018 re-election of, of Maduro. So it was, a, it was a slow process between 2013 in 2018, but by the time we got to Maduro's f recent re-election, in which the, the main opposition candidates were barred, um, we're not talking about competitive authoritarian regime anymore, we're talking about outright autocracy. The opposition, we have to remember, is a very motley group. It's a very, very broad, heterogeneous group, very fragmented. Um, it's not a single political party. It's not two political parties. It's a whole bunch of political parties that range from uh, part of the left to uh, to the far right. And there are so there are people who have very, very different ideas about where the economy should go and very different ideas about about politics. There are different interpretations about what the opposition wants. It depends in part on which members the opposition are talking to. But it's, it's basically a broad negative coalition in the sense that they, they all agree that they want the, this regime uh, to be removed. They want the Chavistas or Maduro and his clique out of power, and they want the, the bases created for a free election. So they want a democratic transition. Um, my guess is that beyond that, beyond the removal of the, of the current regime and the establishment of a, of a transitional government that holds free and fair elections. Beyond that, these guys don't agree. Uh, and this is very common in, in democratic transitions. Oppositions form broad, very heterogeneous fronts that um, know they want to get the authoritarians out, but really don't know much about what they want after that. They'll have to work it out. But that's been done before. It's, uh, you know, sometimes it's a messy process, um, but the, the first step is... Um, establishing conditions for a democratic transition and allowing uh, all the different voices in, including Chavismo, to play a hand in setting up democratic rules again. Now, if you talk to uh, supporters of the government, if you talk to observers who are uh, sympathetic to, to the Chavista government, they will tell you, these guys aren't Democrats. They say they're Democrats, but, um, but they, they're going to be equally authoritarian in power. That claim cannot be dismissed entirely because the opposition has at times behaved in an anti-democratic manner. There was, uh, and this was a very, very unfortunate move on the part of the opposition, but in 2002, there was a military coup against Chavez that overthrew Chavez um, not long after he was elected. 
well before the regime had sunk into uh, into authoritarianism, when it was still a pretty democratic regime, um, despite quite a bit of concentration of power, uh, overthrew Chavez and uh, and jailed Chavez and canceled elections, dissolved the the freely elected Congress, dissolved the Constitution, dissolved the Supreme Court, um, and um, looked pretty authoritarian. Now that coup failed after a couple of days, but um, the behavior of the opposition in 2002 was anything but democratic. My guess is at this point, the opposition, its goals are basically democratic. They want to remove uh, uh, the Chavistas from, from power, and they know that it, you know, based on public opinion surveys, um, they stand a pretty good chance of winning a, a free and fair election if one were held. So they have every interest in supporting uh, a return to democracy. We have to keep in mind that the opposition had basically tried every strategy under the sun. They've been trying for nearly two decades to remove this regime. And so they tried uh, a coup in 2002. They tried mass protests and a general strike uh, in late 2002, early 2003. They tried to remove the government via a recall referendum in 2000, 2000, 2000, 2003, 4 They tried boycotting elections in 2005. They tried participating elections in 2006 and 2012 and 13. They tried mass protests again in 2014. They tried uh, taking over the legislature uh, through electoral means in 2015. Then they tried mass protests again. They have tried, uh, they've been trying and trying and trying again. Moderate strategies, radical strategies, democratic strategies, uh, uh, sort of coup mongery, they've tried it all. And so this was one more strategy. It was a creative one. Um, the, the opposition, the, the strategy that had been in place since about 2012, led by more moderate, pragmatic wing of the opposition uh, associated with Enrique Capriles, uh, who had run for president unsuccessfully in 2012 and 13, that was deemed to have failed. Capriles and that wing of the opposition had lost some support, had lost a certain amount of, of, of legitimacy. And so Guaido was one, a new face, uh, which the opposition needed. It needed to sort of put, put a, a new face forward, a new foot forward. And this was another strategy. It's not that illegitimate. He's the president of the National Assembly. The National Assembly, the legislature, was legitimately elected, was freely elected in 2015. If the elected president, the executive branch, um, steps beyond the Constitution and, and, and sort of loses constitutional authority or legitimacy, it's not, out, it's not unheard of for the president of the National Assembly to uh, uh, be named interim president. It's an unusual step. It doesn't, it doesn't make him a parallel president, but he, as the president of an elected National Assembly, I would say has more legitimate authority than does uh, Maduro after his completely farcical re-election in 2018. So it's not a crazy idea. What it was mainly aimed at, it doesn't really change the balance of power in Venezuela, but it was aimed at um, upping the pressure on the regime, the external pressure on the regime. On, on winning international support and getting major international players to withdraw their support or withdraw the recognition of the Maduro government and give it to, to Guaido. And that has happened to a significant degree. It hasn't been enough yet to bring down the regime, but uh, it, was, it was a pretty creative strategy um, that definitely succeeded in, uh, one, renovating and improving the image of the opposition, um, uh, shaking things up and sort of giving the opposition momentum in its struggle against the regime and in garnering greater international support for the opposition. So it's been, it hasn't succeeded in the final goal of bringing down Maduro, but um, it has strengthened the opposition's hand. Unfortunately, I don't think we can expect the, the military to, to act on behalf of the national interest. I think if the military were acting on behalf of the national interest, it probably would have thrown Maduro under the bus by now. The military is going to act in its own interest. Uh, and individual military officers are going to act in their own interest. Yes, it's possible. In fact, the, the most viable route out at this point, the most viable road to democracy, the most likely path is for the, first, uh, the military to effectively throw Maduro under the bus. To, to remove Maduro, probably remove his clique from power, um, and then negotiate the military 
negotiate with the with the opposition. The military has a lot to negotiate with the opposition. Um, I think the the likelihood of a successful negotiation between Maduro and the opposition is very low, because Maduro has almost nothing to gain from such a, a negotiation. Any kind of successful negotiation at this point must involve a free and fair election. It's unimaginable that the opposition would agree to anything less than free and fair elections. And Maduro knows that he cannot hope to win a free and fair election. He will never grant a free and fair election unless somebody makes him do it. So I, I'm very pessimistic about the about negotiations between Maduro and the opposition getting anywhere. The military, on the other hand, has a lot to negotiate. The military, for one, can negotiate because um, the military doesn't have to win elections. All the military has to do is go back to its barracks. Military leaders want to know that they're not going to be um, purged, that they're not going to be put on trial for corruption and human rights abuses. So one thing that can be negotiated, it's not easy, it's not, um, it's not always that attractive, but one thing that can, that's definitely up for negotiation is some sort of amnesty for military leaders. And military basically would, um, would negotiate its return to the barracks. Uh, as long as it feels like uh, military commanders and their organization are more or less protected, there's a lot of room for negotiation. So th that the military could do, negotiate a transition, I'm pretty confident. The question is, when would the military make this decision to throw Maduro on the bus? It's impossible to know. The thing is that coups are hard to pull off. Coups require coordinated action among military leaders. Um, coordinated action that... Um, that gets planned in secret. So basically, we need to make a deal in, in, in late in the evening among, say, you know, 25 or 50 or 100 military commanders. And we all have to get up the next morning and be confident that everybody else is going to go ahead with the plan. And um, they're, they're not. They're having a great difficulty acting collectively or coordinating, in part because the government... Um, at least reportedly, with a fair amount of Cuban help, has a pretty effective um, system of monitoring these guys. These guys are very closely monitored, or at least they believe that they're very closely monitored. So they're terrified of, uh, you know, getting picked up by the by some intelligence agents a few hours before the coup start to happen. They're terrified that um, that they're going to act. And the other 99 that they made agreement with are not going to act, and they're going to get busted. Um, so they're, they're, they do not yet have the confidence that they're all going to be able to act in a coordinated way. And that, in part, is a product of, of fear. It's a product of uncertainty. It's a product, I think, of the effectiveness of the, the government's sort of surveillance and monitoring capacity. It's not just the fact that they um, are bought off. There are many, many bought-off militaries that have rebelled against unpopular governments. But it's really hard for these. My, my guess is that a lot of these guys, if you talk to them in private, in secret, they would love to see Maduro go tomorrow. But they're having a lot of difficulty acting collectively. It, it's tough. Uh, external pressure for um, for democracy is always, is always pretty difficult, particularly... Um, their negative conditionality meaning it's, it's one thing to do what the European Union did with Southern Europe in the 70s, Central Europe in the 90s, which is say, we'll give you these carrots if you democratize. That works pretty well, or that can work pretty well. Um, we're going to punish you for for um, for behaving in an authoritarian manner. The record for that kind of external sanctioning is really mixed, and it's particularly mixed with countries uh, in countries that are relatively big. And countries that have oil. So the as bad as the economy is, the fact that Venezuela has oil gives it a certain amount of autonomy from um, from from the outside world. So external pressure is never um, there's no guarantee that it works. The the its record is pretty spotty. Um, I think this talk of military intervention is uh, is crazy talk though. That I think a, um, a an actual military intervention as has been put on the table by, actually, by both occasionally members of the Trump administration and members of the opposition, um, I think that would be a disaster. Um, I still think that for normative reasons at this point, this 
this regime is uh, is responsible for such serious human rights abuses and so much and such a humanitarian crisis that it is it is important that the international community put pressure on the regime. I think that uh, that external sanctions and even derecognition of the government, as we've seen, are um, again there's no guarantee they work. They're double-edged. They have negative consequences, but that they're worth doing.